Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina. Thank you for waiting. We had a couple technical difficulties that made us start a little bit late, but that's okay. We're still ready to teach y'all some awesome things. So today for the education station, we do have an awesome friend named Drury, and then Julia who will be talking about her. If you guys have been watching our education stations the last couple of weeks, you will remember that we did try to bring her a few weeks ago. Uh, she decided to start shedding, so we are thankful that she is now done shedding, so you guys can meet this beautiful little lady. Be sure if you guys enjoy our presentations and enjoy learning about all these different things that you share them comment uh, make sure your friends know all about them and with that I will go ahead and give it to Julia all right so like Christina said I have Jersey here with me and she is the boa constrictor that we have here in our education department and Jersey actually has a very interesting story so Jersey is one of our rescue animals she was actually found swimming in the floodwaters after Hurricane Sandy, and that's where she got her name, Jersey. She was obviously someone's pet since they aren't native to the East Coast, um, and she was very um, familiar with people, so she actually swam right up to some people. Um, she knew she needed help, and being a pet, she relied on humans to help her with things. So she swam right up to a group of people needing help, and they ended up bringing her to a zoo. And they did try looking for her owners, but she never ended up being claimed, um, probably because um, they're actually an illegal snake to have out there. So people aren't typically gonna claim those pets if they're not supposed to have them in the first place. Um, and so the zoo decided that she had such a good demeanor um, and was such a um, docile snake having been raised by humans, that she would be a really good fit for an ambassador program. So that is how she made her way here to the zoo. Um, and there's actually a lot of states, including Iowa, that have snake restrictions um, for having pets. So here in Iowa, there are size limits on what type of snake you can have as a pet. And then we also limit uh, natives. So you cannot have a native snake as a pet here in Iowa because our farmers need those snakes out in the fields helping control the rodent population. Isn't it even illegal to harm them in Iowa? It, it is, is, yeah. So um, you can move them off your land if you don't want them there, but any harm or um, killing of a native snake would also be illegal here in Iowa. What are, just to get a quick example, what are a couple of our native snakes that we have in Iowa? Here in <laughs> Iowa, the most common ones are gonna be the fox snake and the bull snake. Uh, those are usually found in prairie areas. And then we also do have a few type of rattlesnake. Um, rattlesnake are very, very solitary and it's really difficult to find them even if you're looking for them. So that's not typically something you're gonna worry about encountering. And then we also have our uh, common garter snakes that people okay. get in their yards quite often. So we have this beautiful snake in front of us. Is she normal sized for a boa constrictor? She is, so she could grow a little bit longer or um, put on a little more weight and be a little thicker. But for the most part, she is full grown. How, how long is she? She, it's very hard to measure her because she does like to coil up on things and move around. Um, so our estimate is between 10 and 11 feet. Okay, that's a nice size snake for sure. <laughs> Uh, what is Jersey's favorite meal? Her favorite meal? I mean, I'm not sure. She loves food in general. She gets very excited on feeding day. Um, and she gets a variety of things. So rat, uh, guinea pig, uh, rabbit, quail, and chick are all different things that she's offered. Um, guinea pig and rabbit are a little bit newer, so she responds a little differently to those. Um, she's still kind of learning what that scent means and that's a little more fun for her maybe. That is awesome. How often do we feed her at the zoo? So being a snake this big, she eats really large food items. So um, her food is you know, a pretty good size large rat or a small rabbit, large guinea pig. And because she eats such large food items, it takes her a very long time to digest it. So we only feed her every other week. She gets fed um, every other Thursday. So she'll get some dinner tonight. And it takes her most of that two weeks to digest all of that food and be ready again for more food. Um, and sometimes even um, if we've happened to feed something even bigger than normal, in two weeks when we feed her again, she's still not hungry. And so um, we just kind of skip that week and 
keep going with her schedule. Okay, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is the fun of snakes with only feeding them every so often, they only go to the bathroom every so often. Yes. Makes cleaning them very easy. <laughs> it is very easy to clean up after them, but when they do go, yeah, it's, it's not fun. enjoyable for anybody. <laughs> uh, we have Bill asking, how old is she? So, so being a rescue, we were really unsure of her age. Um, she was already an adult size when she was found, so um, there's really no way to estimate how old she is. Okay. Uh, let's see. So where would she be found in the wild, since you said she wasn't native to New Jersey? That is a great question. Um, so they should be found in Central and South America in the rainforests. Uh, they are also a very common invasive species. Um, and so we talk about invasive animals quite often with zoos. And invasive means an animal is living in an area that they shouldn't be. So the habitat might mimic their native habitat, but they're not actually supposed to be there. So places like Florida are really common uh, where we find boa constrictors, but they aren't supposed to be there. And it can actually have detrimental effects to uh, Florida's wild native animals. Kind of like the Burmese python, is she down there yep, too? Yep. So um, there's a lot of animals that are invasive to Florida that we would find in the rainforest because it's a very, very similar uh, temperature and humidity setup in Florida. Okay, we have Colleen asking if she can be harmful. She could be, I mean, an animal can be harmful if you don't give them the space and safety that they need. So Jersey obviously is sitting right here. I'm not a big threat to her right now. Um, she knows me, she knows my scent, she's very comfortable with me. If I were to um, maybe start touching too close to her face, which she wouldn't like, she might get upset. She's also very tail sensitive. Um, so we see at the end of her right there, her body is really thick and then it tapers off right here. And they actually have a prehensile tail to hold onto things. And she's very tail sensitive. So sometimes if we accidentally touch her tail, she flicks it away very fast. If we were to, you know, aggravate her and keep touching that, it might kind of build her up to the point where she's a little more feisty with us. Okay. As I always like to say when I do programs, anything with the mouth can bite. I, I love to tell children, you can bite me. I would prefer that you don't, though. Uh, so that's the same situation with snakes. As long as you treat them with respect, they're going to do the same to you. Uh, we had Nancy ask if she eats frozen or fresh. So we feed all pre-frozen meat here at the zoo, and that is across the board. Um, so any mice or rabbit or meat that we're feeding to any of our animals here has been frozen, and then we'll thaw that out um, to feed to our animals. So for animals like snakes that um, rely on the environment to warm their body temperature, we will thaw that food until it's room temperature, and then we actually heat it up just a little bit more so that they can see it better. And there's a couple reasons that we choose to feed that frozen food. Um, one being it's safer for them physically because sometimes that live food can fight back and we wouldn't want our animals to get injured trying to eat their dinner. And then another reason is when we freeze that food item, we're actually killing any bacteria it could be carrying. So then we're also ensuring that they're eating something healthy that's not gonna make them sick. Okay, uh, we have Shelly asking how strong are her jaws? Her jaws, I don't actually know in like pounds per square inch. Do you know that one? Uh, for her jaw, no. I know her muscles for her body can squeeze 25 pounds per square inch though. Okay, so, so that's, that's very, very strong. strong. <laughs> yes. um, I'm not sure with the jaw and uh, mostly what they're using their jaw for is just a quick grab and then they wrap their body around the food item. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. We'll have to look that one up later. And to give a representation of how strong their muscles are, our blood flows at about six pounds per square inch. Like I said, she can squeeze 25 pounds per square inch. So there's a major difference <laughs> between her muscles versus ours. And if you are curious as to what her jaw looks like, we do actually have a example of a uh, large constrictor jaw over here. So you can see how her teeth are hooked back, just kind of like Julia said, they're gonna be used as a quick grab. And those hooks allow her to grab her food and her food can't pull away. And so can you explain a little bit how she is able to eat with that jaw though while, while we have the jaw on display right now? Uh, so so snake, snake jaws, jaws are very uh, different than ours. Our jaws, if they detach, it's very painful and you should go to the doctor if that happens. Um, <laughs> snakes are able to stretch that jaw um, down 
to fit food in. And her jaw even splits down the middle, so she can not only move her jaw down, but out to the sides. The and then she'll actually use those two different pieces to kind of bring that food item into her mouth farther and farther. So that's how she's able to eat without hands? Yes. yes. And to kind of show the representation of, compared to their head size, just how big they can open their jaw, if we could stretch our jaws proportionally um, to the size that snakes do, we could swallow a watermelon whole. So um, <laughs> even though they have these tiny little heads, they're able to stretch them really wide and eat those larger prey items. That is pretty awesome. I've always think that snakes are cool, but just learning all those little things are always an added bonus. Uh, we have a question from Colleen asking if she is poisonous. She, she is not. And so poisonous is a really hard term to use with animals and it gets used a lot with snakes. Um, but it's actually, really there is no snake that's poisonous, because poison means that I would have to eat it to get sick. Um, the term we would use with a snake would be venomous. So there are a lot of venomous snakes that have um, venom pouches and fangs that can inject that toxin into their prey and then eat it later. She is a constrictor though, so she is just going to squeeze her food in order to incapacitate it, she has no venom anywhere in her body. Okay, so a good way to look at poison versus venom is poison is ingested, you have to eat it, versus venom is injected. Yes. yes. All right, and so I have a cool thing that I, that I love about snakes. So I know that some snakes um, can lay their eggs and some actually a lot of people don't or no don't. So can you explain that a little bit more? So Jersey would be one of those snakes that doesn't lay a nest of eggs. She does lay eggs obviously being a reptile but she is an animal that we would consider ovoviviparous. And what that word means is that she actually has a separate body cavity towards the end of her tail where she'll lay her eggs into and hold on to them until they hatch. And so for a while, scientists actually thought these animals had live births because they saw snakes coming out of snakes. Um, and then they discovered that there were actually the remains of eggs inside the snake still. So they do lay eggs, they just keep them with them as a way to protect them rather than laying them into a nest. That is pretty awesome. Do you know about how many snakes do that? Um, I believe that all boa constrictors do. Yes. And then I'm not sure um, other than that what snake species. I believe Kenyan sandbars and rattlesnakes are the other ones that I know. I know that there's more than that, but those yeah. are at least ones that I know. Um, and so, do you know about how long they come out when they're born? The, the snakes? snakes? Yes. Um, I believe for a snake her size, they would probably be around six inches long. Six to 12 inches, I think, is what I've heard. So yes, they come out a lot bigger than you would expect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she can have anywhere from about 20 to 50 babies, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. That's impressive. That, yeah, that's a lot of babies. I'll let her do that. <laughs> Um, so some other f interesting things. So with her pattern, is there a specific thing that her pattern would help her with camouflage? Um, so hopefully the lights are actually helping with this, but if you see on parts of her body, um, we have what we would call an iridescence, and it's kind of a rainbow effect on her scales. And being in the rainforest, uh, when it's raining and her scales get wet, that iridescence is even more obvious and it helps her blend in. So a lot of times when branches have a lot of water on them, they kind of have that rainbow effect as well. So it gives her really great camouflage. And it's actually one of the ways that um, we've determined that she's a crossbreed of two different boa constrictors. So her base coloring, this brown, is uh, really common for red tail boas, but red tail boas don't typically have this much iridescence. So she probably, um, especially since we know she came from um, the pet trade probably, she's probably crossbred, and so she's kind of got some features of two different species, which make her um, really, really pretty uh, when she's out in the rain or um, just under these lights. You can see her iridescence really well. If you ever see her at Critter Corner, that is a time where those, that iridescence really mm -hmm. shines, literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, and so speaking of boas, do you know how many different types of boas they are and where they're typically found? There are, uh, what did we say earlier, 40? 40, 40 different, 40 types, different of types of boa. Um, and they can be found um, in lots of different areas. So um, boas are going to typically be a more arboreal one, so they are going to be in forested areas. Okay, they're going to be up in the trees and forested. Mm -hmm. And then do you know the difference between a boa and a python? Um, there are some genetic differences, and then um, 
they're gonna have some different habitats, I believe, as well. I think but pythons aren't going to be as hum humid for rainforest areas. Right, yeah, they're gonna be a little more drier, whereas the boas do enjoy that humidity. Okay, and then we have a question from Kayla. How is her sight? How is her sight? Um, so right now, especially just since she shed and has fresh new scales over her eyes, um, she has her full vision right now. Um, but snakes, they do see a little bit different than us. So she actually sees temperature more than she's seeing um, like colors and things like that. And that's one of the reasons that we'll make sure her food is warmer than the room. Because then when we put it in her enclosure, it's really easy for her to find. Um, she just kind of has to look for that hot spot. And then she'll use her tongue um, to kind of smell the air. They have a special organ in the roof of their mouth, so their tongue actually picks up air particles. And then when they press it to the roof of their mouth, um, their brain is able to read a smell. And so she'll flick her tongue and look for that hot spot. That's how she would find her food. OK, so that's why she's always sticking her tongue that's out. That's why she's sticking her tongue out all the time. Uh, we have a question from Colleen. What are her predators in the wild? Predators. Um, so when she's young, a lot of um, birds of prey would definitely be a predator for her. Uh, maybe even some of our larger carnivores that live in the rainforest as well. As she gets bigger, she does have fewer and fewer predators. And then like with most of our animals that are towards the top of the food chain, humans are always gonna be a predator as well. Okay, and is this a type of animal, I know with snakes specifically, there's a lot of times where uh, reptiles get taken out of the wild. Is this one of those animals that maybe that could happen to? Yeah, and so um, they're really important to maintaining their habitat. So it is um, really detrimental to the ecosystem when they are removed and you know taken into the pet trade and sold and things like that. So um, that is you know one of the cases where humans would be considered a predator, removing them from the environment they should be in. Okay, we have a question from Pam. How much does she weigh? She is pretty hefty. Um, she's around 40 pounds and she is pretty much solid muscle. She's very, very strong. Um, and sometimes um, she's very active, so she feels like she's about 200 pounds when we're trying to hold her. <laughs> that is true. Um, when she's nice and relaxed and calm like she is right now, she feels like that 40 pounds, so. <laughs> okay, and then we had Rose asking, how big can she get? How big can she get? So like I said, for the most part, she's full grown. She could um, grow a couple more inches, put on maybe another pound or two. I think 14 is the max that they've yeah, ever found. So she, she probably won't grow much more with us. She's at a really healthy size. Um, but I mean, she could surprise us and grow another inch. It would be hard to tell since it's very hard to measure her if she grew an inch, but uh, maybe she'll surprise us. So we keep saying she, do we actually <laughs> know that Jersey is a she? We, we do. do. So um, when we were talking about how she's ovoviviparous and they have that extra body cavity to hold the eggs, that's only something females are gonna have. And you can actually see it on x-rays. So. Okay. Um, after she had her vet checkups and um, they did x-rays just to make sure she was fully healthy after they found her, um, you could see that body cavity. And so they were and able to determine, determine she was female. Is there any sexual dimorphism between male and females in this species? Um, I don't think so. I think females are sometimes typically bigger, are they because, bigger? Of the obi because of the fact that they have the eggs inside their body. Okay. And so at least I've, I've read a little bit with some species of boas that they're going to be larger since mm -hmm. they have to protect the babies oh, inside. Yes. All right, do we have anything else that you want to talk about with Jersey? I think we covered all my favorite topics. <laughs> all right, well then, if that is the case, if you guys have any further questions, please continue to ask them and we will answer them for, um, we'll answer them once we're done with this. Uh, but otherwise, if you guys enjoy our programs, we actually are starting to offer some virtual programs. So if you at a company, at school, any of these places would like one of these programs specifically for um, a events or anything like that, feel free to contact us and we can uh, get a virtual program set up for you guys, just kind of like this. But otherwise, we will see you guys next week for our next education stations and zoo creates thank you